announcements. First off, I have Mistborn Earbuds. <laughs> Mistborn Earbuds. All right. <laughs> the rest of them are going to go to people who ask questions in the Q&A. And then from there on, they will go to the first uh, people in line who signed up and got their numbers early. Okay? So, um, but I, I, I'll, I'll throw them. I'm going to try not to hurt anybody. Uh, these are so cool. These were produced. Yeah, yeah. Gummy bear incident. Um, these were produced by the people who do the audiobook. They do a wonderful job with my audiobooks. And so they sent them along to have me remind you all that audiobooks exist. Um, let me go down my little list. We have them this for, or the Elantra 10th anniversary. They are going to order more copies of the Elantris, um, and I, I, I talk about on my blog the leather-bound edition. Um, Mysterious Galaxy, assuming they want some, will have those. There will only be about five stores that have those. So if you're wanting a leather-bound edition of Elantris, they're, they're going to be around 100 bucks. So they're, they're pricey. So if that doesn't appeal to you, go get the paperback. It's cheap. Um, but if that appeals to you, you can talk to these guys, and we'll make sure they have enough supply of those that you can get them if you want them. Um, I haven't cleared that with them yet, but yeah. <laughs> um, I would like you all right now, you've got to post it or multiples. If you didn't get a post-it, you will get one. Do you have one yet? They're going to be posted in the line. Um, who did that before? Were you doing that? Oh, you did that. You just did it as a thank you to me? Okay, you're going to... Yeah. Oh, no, they assigned you. They assigned you. You volunteer. When you get your post-it, you're going to write on it the name of the person you want the book personalized to. You do not have to get it personalized to anyone. If you just leave it blank or if there's no post-it, I will just sign it, okay? Um, but if you will hand me this, when you get your poster, when someone sticks it on, the best place for it is right here, because I sign right here, so it's good to read the name and, and write it right here. But when you do this, just be careful not to go like that. If it sticks to this and to this, then when you close your book, it'll fold the page. Um, and so I've had that happen to people. So, um, oh, that's my post-it. I need that. <laughs> um, so just to, like that, make sure you get up to three personalized books per person. So if you came in a group of 12, then yes, you could have um, a whole bunch. Um, yeah, but um, the, so if you brought seven books, I'll still sign the other ones. The personalization is what takes the time um, and things like that, so I limit those to three. So just put the three that you want personalized on the top with the name in it, and if they're all the same name, you could write times three, uh, but just make sure that one's on top, because if I hit a book without a post-it, I will just sign it, okay? And then once I'm done with the three, I'll sign the rest of them. And you can put a post-it in each one if you're neurotic about it, that's fine too. It's actually easier on me if there's a post-it in each book that's supposed to have a name, okay? Um, pictures. Uh, do we have someone assigned to take pictures for me? We will. We will. <laughs> there will be a person. Where's the line going to be? Is this going to be straight? So it's gonna, we're going to ask everyone, yeah. ask everyone to, to... Not right now. ...line up outside by, numerically, by the number on the back of your receipt. Uh -huh. And then we bring the line in and it sort of wraps around, follows the orange Okay. Wall. And it comes this way? Yeah, it goes yes. this way. So okay. Kind of yeah. Okay. So there will be probably someone on this side grabbing the camera. Yes. What they're going to do is... They're gonna, I'm gonna start signing your books and we do the picture first. By the way, you don't need to do a picture. If you want one, I'm happy to do it. You get in position, they will count. I will look up on three. <laughs> you can watch it, it's very cool, like a trained dog. Bing! <laughs> I go back to signing and then we start talking, right? Um, and I, and if, when you come through, if you have a question, you can ask it, you don't have to have one. I usually ask just in case, but people are like, oh, I didn't think of one, I'm so embarrassed. You don't, have to, you don't have to have a question, it's okay. Um, um, and so that, oh, the last thing I need to uh, announce is my mailing list. I don't make people sign up here because I feel like that's annoying pressure stuff. Like, here's my mailing list, do you love Brandon? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you. Um, but on my website, in my contact form, you can sign up for my mailing list. We send about four mailing list emails a year always includes an unreleased scene from something I'm working on, as well in, in, as a thank you for letting me tell you that I've got a new book coming out. Um, so if you sign up for that, you get that sort of stuff. And we will also, if you mention where you live, anytime I am within about 50 miles of you or so, you will get an email from me saying, I'm gonna be here. Did anyone get these today? Yeah, 
So this is a good way to keep track of where I'm going to be. We don't spam you. Uh, we use MailChimp. It's very effect, uh, effective and efficient. You can unsubscribe very easily. So um, if you want to sign up for that, that's how you do it. Um, I am going to go to the Q&A and throw earbuds at people. And I'm going to do this by region. Um, so this way, um, uh, you don't have to raise your hands all the time. So we'll do the seating pe sitting people first, all right? Purple hat. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've also had problems as an English major with creative writing and fantasy, and I'm just wondering, um, like, how do you get past that? Like, because I'm also yeah. trying to go into <coughs> How do you get past and the professors and people? And the it's, first, a, it's the same with, with yeah. research. It's the first thing you should do as a writer is you should listen to what those people are saying and teaching and try to learn from them. The, I think the strength of fantasy and science fiction as, as genres is that people think we're, they think the wrong things about our genre. You can find literary writers in science fiction and fantasy. Um, N.K. Jameson is doing amazing things with literary fantasy right now. You should be you know, reading her books, they're fantastic. Um, you know, Jean Wolfe, Ursula Le Guin, they, they imagine that, in, that the, the fantasy is, like, is way more strict than it is. So, if you take a class from someone, see what you can learn from them. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, don't back down. Write what you want to write, and uh, don't let them talk you out of loving what you love. Go ahead and try new things, but apply it to what you think is going to help you, and be willing to take the grade hit for it. That's my recommendation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, all right, I'm going to toss this. They're kind of heavy, so watch out, all right? All right. Whoa, I hit that guy. Uh, okay, all right, right here. Uh, so next month is National Novel Writing Month. Yes. Do you have any advice for amateur writers who are just jumping into this endeavor? Really yeah. Okay, NaNoWriMo. Um, I did this for many years before I got published. I was already writing and my friends were all doing it, so I'm like, yeah, I'll, 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 keep, I'll keep, keep going and then I won't tell you guys my work out because you'll feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> we always had like a race where we posted it on a website and I just kind of posted what the daily count was supposed to be. Uh, I, usually, I often doubled it because um, I, was, I was like this even back then before I was published. Um, I would say for you, to number one, um, don't let the, the word count goal intimidate you. If you don't hit 50,000, the whole goal is just to get you out of your writing comfort zone. So for you, 25,000 is where you're going and you actually still do that, that's fine. 50,000 isn't a novel anyway. They just say it is. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, it's technically a novel, but I and mean, how... How many novels are 50,000 words? I'm not going to There's not very many. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of middle grade is around 50,000 words. But um, so um, I would just go for it. Um, the other thing is have a daily habit of when you're going to write and try to make that sacrosanct and get into this habit of, you know, I'm writing for these two hours and kind of unplug during those two hours and write during those two hours. Worry less about what your word count is you're hitting do try to not self-edit. That's the biggest thing that's going to help you. If you're not going back and revising and revising and revising and you're pushing forward, the goal is to teach yourself to finish something and to push forward and turn off your internal editor. All right? All right, here we go. Oh, I'm, I'm throwing them too lightly. All right, right here. What is the worst writing advice you've ever gotten? What is the worst writing advice I've ever gotten? No. <laughs> No, 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 no. There is, the thing about writing advice is most people who are giving writing advice, it works for them, which means it's actually good advice to try out. The only really bad advice is this is the way it must be done, right? Um, because different writers have very different approaches. He mentioned Stephen King. Stephen King can't write with an outline, so he says don't outline. Orson Scott Card says I've got to have an outline or my book stinks. Uh, both of those can't be right. Well, one of them might be right for you. The truth is most writers I know don't outline some things, do outline other things, and come up with this like Frankenstein of different pieces of advice that work for them. Though the absolute worst thing that I ever heard, and I'm not going to say who said this, they were telling my students while I was teaching them, my students came in and said, what do you think of this? Um, to include a glossy headshot with every submission. <laughs> <laughs> to get the attention of editors. But to not include a SAZY, a self-addressed stamp envelope, back in the days, you know, where you, we did this all in print. Because if they liked it enough, they'd track you down. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was really bad. Yeah, good question. So when I spoke in Dubai, 
Was it translated? I speak in English. Yes, they actually had headphones for everybody, and I spoke in English, and they had an interpreter. Um, I, I got to do a speech kind of, you know, like this, and there was a guy there who's like, fantasy's not real. Um, so it was actually kind of fun. He actually said that, um, and the, the, the people in charge were like, oh, it's okay, we're sorry, we didn't mean to offend you. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, which is why I gave, I, I gave my little speech on why fantasy is awesome, and it was super cool. Um, but it, they, they did they didn't interpret it. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. We will go right back there. Yeah, since uh, going back to your opening statements, and since you have boys, I'm concerned about the fact that in our society, especially online society, people don't show what Neil Gaiman talks about the respect we should show to each other, and that we have a highly politicized, highly yep. uh, polarized, and right. snap judgments. And you have young boys, I have a, a young son and daughter. Yeah. What advice? Would you give, since you've thought about that? I've thought about it a lot. I don't know if I've come to any conclusions. Like, um, if you guys followed the whole thing um, in science fiction with the Hugo Awards, like, people on both sides were good friends of mine. Um, and, you know, you talk to them in person, and they're rational. They're like, Here, here's our, my problem with this, and this is kind of why I think it should change. And it's like, wow, that's cool. You talk to the other side, and they're like, this is my problem with this, and why what they're doing. You're like, that's cool. Then they talk online, and you're your screen starts on fire. And I, I actually wrote big emails to both the sides, and I, uh, to the, my friends on both sides. I'm like, be more rational. And then their answer was, but they're not being rational. That's always the answer. And I wrote to them, they're like, but they're not being rational. Um, and I think that, um, I don't know. I, I wish that I had the answer because it's sometimes, you know, I would think it's writers who are supposed to be really open-minded to other people's ideas because that's why we write books is so they explore ideas. Um, but it, you know, we can, you can be open-minded and still disagree. And I think that's the most important thing that I try to get to my kids is you don't have to agree, but just listen first. Um, it, try to understand why they're saying what they're saying. And then if you disagree, just fine. That's great. We are all going to disagree. It's part of what makes us people. We argue about stuff. Um, I wish I had answers. All right, I'm going to throw, throw this back to you, and I think you were the one I promised could ask a question. So I'm going to toss this. Hey, watch out. Watch out, Purple Hat. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going, to, I'm going to hawk this next one. It's going to get there. All right. Um, I was just totally different topic. Uh, of all your books, mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed all of your, your novels. Who is your favorite audiobook narrator who has narrated your novels? Um, it is Michael Kramer. Oh. Um, uh, and that's a bias of mine because having <laughs> listened to a lot of the Wheel of Time books in the early years, I fell in love with Michael and Kate's uh, reading styles, and so I've asked for them specifically um, on several of my projects. I, um, I sometimes like to have somebody different for different books just to have some variety in case there are people who don't like that, but they will continue probably to do Mistborn and, Wave and Stormlight because they're my favorite readers. Okay. Um, I'm actually not going to huck this. Can I? Someone. You, 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 what you, okay. You can have one for yourself and then run one to everybody that. Um, so this is the gentleman in the beard right back there. Okay. You don't want to kill Cookie Girl? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to kill. I don't want to kill Cookie Girl. Okay. Let's, uh, we're going to do this side right now. Uh, so we'll go behind the table first. Excuse me. So when you're building out your magical system, what process do you go through? Because they're fairly. It's a good question. So the question was, how do I develop my magic system? I could give you three lectures on this, and I have done it before. Um, fortunately, I wrote it all down. Um, so I've got a couple resources for you. This goes for anyone who's interested in writing. Um, at my website, brandonsanderson.com slash writing dash advice. Writing dash advice. There are three resources on there. The first are my essays on magic systems. Um, I've done three essays so far. My speech last year was my fourth. You'll have to find that online somewhere. Um, Sanderson's zero law. I named them after myself, because I mean, Asimov did it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he actually named them after himself. But, um, so um, those are going to talk about magic systems and how I developed them in depth. Uh, the other resource I have for you is Writing Excuses, my podcast. Um, oh, thank you very much. 15 minutes of writing advice every week. Start with January of this year. Um, I think they get better and better as we've gone along. And so 
this year's are, are better, and we started kind of a new thing. And the last thing is if you're, you're hardcore and you're kind of masochistic, you can watch my university lectures, um, which are a little more boring and dry. They're an hour and a half long. There's 13 of them. They're linked on my website. Um, and I just I make the university let me record them and post them online as part of having me in there to teach. They're not boring, right? <laughs> Yeah, they put them back up. We, yeah, they, they took them down for a while because uh, we, we put them up, and then the copyright department, who was like, "No, we have to post these." Are like, "We have to, we have to look through them and make sure you don't disparage the university." It's the guy behind the, the, the thing. And so they went and looked through them, and I, I don't know. And then they put them back up. So um, if those ever go down, there's all, there's also the ones at a website called Write About Dragons, which was one of my students recording it for me. Um, okay, in the blue. Um, what was your favorite character to write? My favorite character to write is whoever I'm writing at the moment. <laughs> um, I don't usually pick a favorite. Um, yep, run it. You're gonna run all of these. Just, just, <laughs> you didn't get one free one to run one to somebody. You're just gonna hop around and give them to people. Um, I usually don't, I don't have a favorite character. In fact, here, take these, and then the people I, I point at, you can go give them to. Um, <laughs> uh, and I don't usually have a favorite book. Uh, people ask that a lot. It's like cho choosing a favorite child. All right, other questions over there. Alaska, dude. Uh, is there anything that you've read recently that you are championing? Like oh, yeah, yeah, books? some stuff that I really liked recently. Um, if you haven't read Naomi Novik's book, Uprooted, yeah. that came out in the summer, it is delightful. It's, uh, we, hey, you guys got copies of that, I hope. Um, it's, uh, it's, like, it's like a dark fairy tale written for an adult audience. Um, and so we get a lot of fairy tale retellings that are kind of <coughs> YA or middle grade targeted. This one's, um, she's got Polish descent. She kind of picked, she, there's no specific fairy tale. She just came up with her own. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, it's a little romancy. It's got uh, some fun magic and it's kind of dark, uh, but, uh, but highly recommended. Uh, Brian McClellan, my old student, uh, Promise of Blood, he writes fantastic stuff. Um, and I'm jealous of his, uh, of his, of his magic system. It's really good. Um, what else have I read recently? Uh, Nora Jameson's new book. Uh, I mentioned that. It, if you like literary um, style stuff, uh, what's that one called? Uh, yeah, Jameson. I just read it, but I read it on ebook. Yeah, fifth season. Um, and it's got a character's viewpoint is in the second person, and it works. So, it's the only thing I've ever read in second person that works. Um, it is so good. Um, yeah, uh, there, there's a few for you. Um, my, my, some of my classic favorites, if you haven't read them, are uh, Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinci. Um, it, it, it's the closest thing to reading Dune again that you will ever have, right? It's got that same epic world building, really cool kind of epic scope in a science fiction novel. Um, and I, I love that book. So, there's a, there's a few for you. All right, and the black. Yeah, so um, I'm not allowed to talk about the clones <laughs> writing my books, um, but no, um, I, I have a good, I, I set a, a strict schedule, and what I do is I get up, and I get up at noon, because <laughs> I'm a writer, <laughs> and I'll write from noon until 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock until 8.30 or 9 is family time. And that's just, that's sacrosanct. I don't do anything else during that time except hang out with the family. I play video games with the kids. By the way, if you've got like a seven, eight year old Terraria, great <laughs> for kids, because you can get them on tablets and you like sit them next to you and then you, it works really well. It's like, it's like an easier Minecraft. Um, and so we play games, I, um, I go out with my wife, we do stuff like that. And then at about nine o'clock, the kids are in bed, we're usually back, um, and then I go back to work. And I work from about nine o'clock until as long as I need to work to get my work done that night. Um, and I, when I'm home, that schedule works very well. It can give me up to you know 12 hours of writing time in a day if I'm really crunching on something. So if I don't have a commute, um, it actually you know I get that extra time in my day. Um, and when I don't have a, a time crunch, then I can like you know be done by like 2 a.m. and play some video games or something. So it's actually I have a very um, my my mental health is good. I'm not, um, you don't have to worry about me not sleeping and things like that. On tour, all bets are off. These things usually get done at about midnight or 1 a.m. Um, and I often have a flight the next morning at 8. Um, so, 
So on tour, I just don't sleep. <laughs> and I usually don't eat either, um, but that, you know, I've got, I've got plenty of storage. <laughs> I haven't actually had any food today yet, um, because you get up, you run to the airport, the airport, your gate's getting called, you get on it, you get driven right to the school, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But they're going to give me some shawarma or something for me to take my, to my uh, hotel. Um, so there you are. Um, let's go to in the back. Uh, Miss Cloak, dude. <laughs> um... I was wondering, does Roshar experience storms outside of the high storms and the weepings? And if so, how often would, uh, like, Shinovar get them? Um, so, the weather patterns are so dominated by the high storms that uh, non-high storm storms are rare, but do, okay, uh, do occur. Um, the further to the, um, the, the west you get, the harder it is to tell the difference between a high storm and a regular storm. Like, but in Shinovar, a high storm is just kind of like, a, it, it feels like what a storm you might get here, or even weaker. Um, so, but they do happen. Uh, they, they're gonna happen uh, most often, you're gonna notice them in the quote-unquote summers, um, when the high storms are further apart. So, here's another stack of them for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Memory Keeper. Um, so I was wondering, what planet did humans originate on? Or did they originate on Skadril when Preservation and Ruin got together. Uh, humans did not originate on Skadril because um, they were on Yolan, uh, which is uh, a planet before Aiden Alsium, uh, the story there takes place before Aiden Alsium Shatter. Uh, they may have been on other planets, but they, they, the very first ones you would care about are probably on Yolan. All right, yep. So, okay, with the young man hopping up in the air. Do you write nonfiction books? Do I write nonfiction books? I have not written any full nonfiction books yet. My nonfiction is my class and my podcast. Maybe someday I'll do a writing book. Um, shadow, oh, that's true. We did do it. We did do one called Shadows Beneath, which is where um, uh, I did that um, We wrote. Uh, my friends and I each wrote a story, and then we wrote about why we did that story the way we did. So all of my nonfiction is like articles about writing. Um, so maybe someday we'll do something else, but that's kind of where I am right now. All right, right here. All right, so uh, there's not a lot of Western books coming out these days. Is there anything in particular that made you decide to set uh, Alloy of Law and, uh, and, and the other books in that time period and any challenges moving oh, into that question. time period? Uh, so there aren't a lot of Westerns. Um, you know, what made me do that, write it there. Um, it's hard to say, you know, to reach back into my, uh, you know, my cultural archive, so to speak, in my head, like, um, I, I did watch a lot of spaghetti westerns um, during that era. I think they're cool. Um, but I really think it was more the wanting to deal with something in the early 1900s um, because I love that era. That era in our world was like this era of scientific discovery. Um, it was this revolution that happened right around that time with the coming of electric lights and the coming of motor cars where the, for the first time science was a thing for everybody. Like before that, science was a thing that somebody rich got to do. Um, and then it became something like, I remember reading an essay that was written in like 1910 about a scientist who had gone and taught and studied ditch digging. He'd gone in there with the ditch diggers and he taught them, he found out the science of what makes dick, ditch digging easier on their bodies and on their health and faster. And he basically, he scienced ditch digging for the ditch diggers and they loved that. Um, they, you know, it made them, their jobs much easier. It was a time where science was like that. It was the first time that science was like that. I've got to step back, I'm sprained. Um, and so, um, that time period really fascinates me because you've got this whole, my, my career is based around taking cool things and superstition and that have like one foot over there and one foot in science and kind of bringing those two things together. Um, and that fascinates me and that was a time period where we were transitioning from superstition towards science, and that that's really cool to me. So I picked, wanted to do something that time period, and the Western aspect was just a, just a fun part of it. The, the, the whole pitch of, you know, Clint Eastwood has to move to big city New York and take over, you know, his, his house politics was really interesting to me. All right, I'm still, I'm only doing the standing up. You can ask your, your question, but I have to do it by region. Uh, we can't have time for everybody, I'm sorry. I have to, okay.